And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Bert Hart. I'm the principal here at Geneva Heights. Thank you. Also with us tonight, we have Elizabeth Casas, who's our executive director of this area. Uh, Ms. Jolie Healy, who is our deputy superintendent, is in attendance right there. <laughs> and uh, Ms. Ms. Stephanie, <laughs> Ms. Stephanie Alizalde, chief of school leadership. And of course, our trustee, uh, Mr. Dustin Marshall, who I'll turn the mic over to right now. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Appreciate you guys uh, all taking some time out on a weeknight. I know we all have busy schedules, especially around the holidays. So I, I, I'm impressed with the turnout and thankful that you guys all took the time to be here. It's one of the really special things about the Woodrow feeder pattern um, that there's so much parental engagement. And it is uh, no coincidence that that parental engagement has led to such a great um, success at, across all the schools in the district. So as uh, Bert mentioned, I'm Dustin Marshall. I'm uh, the trustee for most of the Woodrow feeder pattern. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, Mount Auburn Elementary, uh, but I do represent Woodrow Long and all the other elementary schools. Um, so I want to thank you guys all for being here. Thank the administration for putting this together. For, in particular, um, Stephanie Elizalde and Jolie Healy, who have put the slides together for tonight and are going to talk through them for us in a few minutes. Uh, but before I turn the mic over to Stephanie, and I, I think uh, Chief Scott Lane, oh, uh, our, 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 yeah, our COO, Scott Lane, just joined us. He's also going to be, uh, yeah, <laughs> he's also going to be uh, sharing some of the slides uh, uh, tonight. So um, I want to get into a few logistics in just a moment. But before we do that, I just want to sort of set the stage for this conversation. This is very much uh, the beginning stage of a lengthy dialogue. And I think that DISD and the district are often... Um, rightfully accused of making decisions in closed rooms without uh, taking in community input. And this is uh, the first among many steps to avoid doing that um, in the Woodrow feeder pattern. And so um, we're here tonight to discuss options. There is no proposal on the table. Um, there is no sort of um, leaning towards one option or another. I personally have um, not made any preferences uh, or decisions about which of these options I would support. Uh, we are all here tonight so that I and, and the administration can hear from you guys and hear about your questions, hear about your, pre your preferences. So tonight, Stephanie's going to walk us through five different options, um, and we want to hear from you guys about what you think of those. Uh, we are going to take questions at the end of the discussion. Um, I think it's unlikely that we get to all the questions. So there's also some index cards um, that were available up front, and we can uh, pass out for those of you that don't get a chance to ask your question tonight. Uh, we are going to collect all those index cards and we're, we're going to create a website on the DISD website just for this topic where we post all of the questions that we don't get to tonight with the respective answers to those. Um, we're also going to post the video that we're uh, taping in the back right now um, and, you know, continue this dialogue. Um, it's also been suggested, which I think is a great idea, that we form some sort of parent committee with representatives from each of the schools. Um, that could participate in a smaller group format to continue the dialogue after today's discussion. So again, first of many conversations. This is also a conversation about our long range plan, which means nothing's gonna happen anytime soon. Uh, what we are talking about today is part of our next, hopefully, knock, knock on wood, our next bond program, uh, which the, the current thinking is that the bond would happen in 2021. Uh, right now, there's no money to spend on any plan that we could come up with tonight or next month or next year. So nothing's going to happen until we have the money to accomplish that, which would be when a bond happens in 2021. And so, again, um, beginning dialogues, years to come, um, decision, you know, in the future for something that may or may not happen in 2022 and beyond. So a couple of quick logistics um, that I wanted to touch on. I made myself some notes so I didn't miss anything. Um, first is I know that there are some PTA events um, at various schools going on tonight. So in order to respect everyone's time, uh, we scheduled the meeting to be from 6 to 7. Um, I suspect that it will go a little bit beyond that, but we are going to do a very firm hard stop at 7.30 so that everybody can get off to their uh, their next um, agenda items or, or dinner with your family or whatnot. If we don't get to your question, again, please submit it on an index card. You're also welcome to email me at any time. My email address is dustinmarshall at dallasisd.org. Um, Stephanie's going to lead us through the slides, pre present the options, and then we'll take questions at the end. We've got a microphone we're going to pass around. We will also collect the additional questions on index cards, as I mentioned. We are recording and streaming the meeting on Facebook Live. You're welcome to share it on social media today, or you can access it later on video. We also have translation services, um, both in Spanish and in sign language available. So if uh, 
if you need either of those services, please talk to the guys in the back. Um, and uh, with that, I will hand it over to Stephanie Elizalde. So thanks. Good evening and thank you very much. Um, thank you, Trustee Marshall. This is, I wanna reiterate, this is just a beginning. This will be an ongoing dialogue. So please don't feel like, oh, we didn't get to certain, maybe there's a new idea that even surfaces. This needs to be an ongoing and uh, conversation dialogue and we'll certainly work at how to create a committee that will have parents and uh, community members and teachers, et cetera. Right now we wanna kinda get the big picture out there Usually when there's a bond, before it goes to the voters, we're rushing to try to figure out what are we gonna put in that bond? And then you're trying to make everybody happy, which usually means no one's happy. This is a little different, which I'm hopeful is really a positive thing in that let's gather what we think our needs are in advance so that when we go for a bond, we're not struggling to try to figure out how are we gonna do that. And so we use data um, as Scott Lane uh, was entering. Everything we're doing here is based on numbers. Now that's hard. And sometimes we actually have folks that go, but you're making a decision based on numbers. Yes, that's usually what we try to do. However, emotions are always a part of the decision making and we get that. So there's some contextual factors which is why we have to come to the community that I do not understand because I'm not of this community. While I live in Dallas ISD, I'm not part of the Woodrow feeder. So there are unique um, characteristics and personalities of each of our communities. And we really, really, this is one of those where we're not just saying, we really want your input and then we're gonna go and make whatever decision uh, we think needs to be made. Uh, new options came up as, as late as uh, today. So those can be incorporated as we move on. So um, again, no money is available right now, but let's think about if we did have it, based on the data, we were using schools that had over 300 students and whose facility condition index was over 70%, which means it would take at least 70% to um, renovate an existing building. Am I saying that right, Scott? 60%. So in that instance, is it better to, it, what, at what point do you decide putting money into a building is really not worth the taxpayer money? When do we get a new building? So one of the conditions or one of the factors you're gonna see as we move through this is that we wanna also respect the fact, um, sure. This is of course gonna happen to me. Yeah, it, but not on the screen, so. Okay, well, I think we need to get to a chair though. Thank you though. So we've done the introductions. You know, the schools have done a fantastic job in your uh, feeder pattern, particularly, thank you, particularly um, because of parental involvement. And so uh, I think we would, we would be remiss if we did not thank you all and ask you to applaud yourselves for the fantastic academic achievement that we see in this feeder pattern. So I think, good job. We know there's a lot of um, growth and it's happening in lots of different areas. It doesn't always happen the way we like it in terms of can we have exactly the same number at every single school and have every school be a pre-K five? So that's why we think this is a unique opportunity we want to make sure we're not putting more kids than really optimally should be in our schools. We want to look at future bond and of course a timeline and the input is critical. So with that, this slide, although it's a little bit difficult, uh, you can see the actual accountability data. Woodrow Wilson earned all seven out of seven distinctions. Long earned four out of seven. Both of those, uh, the Texas Education Agency rated as B school districts. Um, we've got Lakewood that was, um, the Texas Education Agency gave an A. 
two with three out of six distinctions. Mockingbird is also an A. And then we see Lipscomb was a B, three out of six. And we have a couple of schools that we're continuing to work on and are moving in towards that B and will be at at least a B um, by the end of this school year, correct? All right, that's what I thought. So what does the pattern in terms of growth look like in our community here at the Woodrow Wilson Feeder? So you can see that the majority of all our campuses with really, for the most part, two exceptions, Mount Auburn had a decrease from 2017 to 2018 and actually has had a small decrease each of the last few years, but remember that that also coincides with the expansion of the addition of Montessori Mata. So many of the, there was a targeted attendance zone. So some of those students then left that would have been going to Mount Auburn if they applied and got into Mata through the lottery system. Most of the students would be coming. There's a first group of students that is a targeted attendance zone. And then also a small decrease with uh, Lipscomb. So as we continue looking through the data, just looking at the optimal capacities of our schools, um, you'll see that currently Long really does have slightly more students than we really have space for when we consider optimal capacity. Now optimal capacity is usually approximately 90 to 95% of every seat in that building. So yes, you have a little bit of space, um, but that's not where we wanna be. There's of course the new addition um, and the renovation going on at Long. So that will be remedied at that time. You see Mockingbird, Lakewood, we've got space at Geneva Heights and at Lipscomb and some at Mount Auburn. So when we do look, here you can, we visually wanted to do an aerial snapshot of the two schools that right now we're talking about. But further ideas may even include additional schools. But from this, we wanted to be able to look at what is the space, physical space, if you're doing some additions, what's the green space, what are the streets surrounding, because we also, regardless of what we do, right, we need to look at traffic patterns, we're going to need to look at lights, we need to look at, you know, what's that flow going to do to a neighborhood, lots of things we have to take into account. So we just wanted to be able to kind of give a snapshot of what this looks like really of importance here is that the facility condition index for Geneva Heights, formerly Robert E. Lee, is 91%, which means we need a lot of work in our building. Now, again, right now we don't have the money for it, but we know we will have to have something because there are several of our school buildings that are going to need some assistance. Now, this is actually uh, one of Scott Lane's slides. Um, because everything that we do, there's a flow chart. So, you know, you start by asking yourself, okay, so how old is the building? And wh what is the facility condition index? What's the learn score? So we've got this ETL, E2L, which is, our, is our building ready for technology in the classroom for students to use it in the way it should be used? The days of we're gonna go put a lab and kids rotate through the lab, that's not the real world. We've gotta have computers in the classrooms for students to be using it. It has to be transparent. It's gotta be a part of what they're doing daily. That doesn't happen in a lab. So well, when you have concrete walls, how am I gonna make sure we've got connectivity? How am I gonna make sure we've got enough electrical outlets? How, so there's a whole series Movable furniture, we ask teachers, we've got to increase the way in which we teach cooperative learning because all of our industries, industries are telling us after college, we need kids who work, can work with others in teams. Well, when you have newer furniture that you can move around easily in a classroom, a teacher's able to do that. When you have fixed furniture, it's very difficult for them to meet the needs. So we're asking our teachers to do things when they don't have all of the resources necessary to make that come true. So when you look at, and this was presented to the board, when you look at our flow chart, 
that's uh, part of how we end up, should we replace or should we renovate? Is there anything you want to add to this, Scott? So this section right here, what I call the contextual factors, is what Scott calls emotions, right? This part's all money, numbers, and over here are the real world checks. What are the impacts? So for instance, as you're gonna see on another slide, this one here is the master plan in terms of what the site, if we were to look at the site, what are some of the things that could be done with Geneva Heights? And I know everybody probably wants to look at that one, but let me talk about some considerations. There's another slide here that talks about like most of our schools don't have anywhere near the space they need in the cafeterias because they were built at a time when we had, you know, kitchens are small, the cafeterias are small. So almost every single one of them we look at and Scott's like, we've got to enlarge the kitchen. We've got to enlarge the cafeteria space. The libraries are usually small. Sometimes we have more classrooms. And when we do those walkthroughs, the classrooms are not being used for classrooms because also back when our schools, most of our schools were built, administrative offices were very small. There weren't counseling offices. Well, they've got to use some space to have that, so they end up using classroom space in order to have those spaces for students to be able to meet with their counselors or their assistant principal, et cetera, or principal. So let me kind of go through, um, and this will all be posted so that you can reference it and really go through it and ask us questions about what we're looking at at this point. This slide, which of course is impossible to see unless you're the six million dollar man, which probably no one in this room even knows what I'm talking about, but in any event, this is going to list even the costs um, of the types of plans that Scott's team has put together in terms of the renovations or the building of a new school. So there's a lot of these, lots of how did they, where's the facility condition index number coming from? So here's a summary of what's evaluated. Because sometimes there's some schools that people go, I can't believe that, that it's that bad. Well, sometimes it's not part of what you can see. So like if the HVAC is just completely needs to be replaced, that's a huge cost, right? But nobody really sees it. Or a roof, the entire roof needs to be fixed. Again, that's an area no one's going to necessarily see it. So it kind of works. There's some schools that people will tell me, no, the FCI needs to be way worse than that. And then there are others that are like, that one's not that bad. But there's, there, we did not do that. That's certainly not my wheelhouse. Scott hired a team that does that specifically and have done it all over the country. So it was a consistent process. They have um, great, I mean, they've done it all over the United States. So that's where we got most of the data with regard to that. So let's get to the part that everybody's here for. In, with the opportunity of being able to do uh, possibly a new Geneva Heights, the question arose, I mean, we can do what you see there as, it's very difficult to see, but option one, which basically says we don't talk to anybody else except the folks at Geneva Heights and we just redo the school at Geneva Heights and continue on our way. But our data say that there are quite a few kids that are living in our Woodrow Wilson feeder that are not coming to Geneva Heights or Lipscomb or some other campuses that perhaps we might even be able to encourage through the new building, a process that might have some more students want to come to our schools. So option two and three end up affecting Mockingbird and Geneva Heights in terms of initial proposal proposals, while option four and five, when we get through to those, get to those, those actually affect the entire group of elementary schools and even have an effect on JL Long. So, like I said, option one, we, we just move forward with planning the possibility of a new school at Geneva Heights. Option two, what about kind of following a private school kind of model of an upper and a lower school, where what you would have is one school could be a 
you would have one attendant zone for Geneva Heights and for Mockingbird. One school would be a pre-K-2, and another school would be a three through five. So one's an upper school, one's a lower school. They still have individual principals. There's pros and cons to those, and I'll be going through each of those in just a minute. Option three goes almost the same thing, but a little bit different in our numbers because what if we created a pre-K-8 model? So still an upper and a lower school, but going ahead and going through like a pre-K-3 and then having a 4-8. Options four and five really talk about can we create possibly pre-K-6s in multiple locations or could we create an intermediate school at one of these sites at fifth through six, that would be fifth through six. Now, the reason we have this as an option is how big do we want to build Geneva Heights? That's why it's imperative. If we're just going to build for the students we have, then we'll just build this school for 650 essentially, and you know, it'll be done. Or if we want to look at some of these models, then we wouldn't want to recommend a school of 650 if it looks like we would need a school of 750 or 850. That's why this dialogue is going to be so important. So I think the first one, pretty simple. We rebuild Geneva Heights. But look at the considerations, if you will, on the far right. These are some of the things that we know we have to continue to think about, talk about. Um, and those are just the items that we're thinking about. There's been some conversation of, you know, there, this building has a lot of historic character. Is that something that we need to be, it needs to be part of the consideration. Does that mean we want to consider everything inside gets gutted, but we keep, you know, three of the four exterior walls and, and Scott takes one of the walls and that's the one we look at extending out? What does that look like? We want to look at our data. How many kids are transferring in? How many are not coming to school here based on what data can we, can we gather? Option two. So let's go into this one a little more in depth. So here, um, and again, I want to reiterate what Trustee Marshall said. We are not committed to any of these. We're committed to gathering input. That's what we're committed to doing. We want to make sure that this becomes a decision that is from, or the recommendation comes from our community. Rezoning would then take place, as I mentioned earlier, so that Geneva Heights uh, and would, or Mockingbird in this instance, and I don't know, we're, we're not married to either one of those either. Mockingbird could be the pre-K-2, Geneva Heights could be the 3-5. The um, reason it's important, though, to know which school we're going to do what at is because there are certain regulations with students that are under the age of seven. So in Dallas, there's a fire code. No student in first grade or below can be on a second floor. So you have to, I have to think about that then when I start looking at, oh, well, does this school fit that model better or does the one we're going to renovate fit that model better? So... Sometimes there are constraints that we don't control, but we certainly have to take them into account. Um, then what we showed here were the actual numbers of students that we have currently enrolled so that we could see how much space that would then create for additional students. We also have consideration of, we know that at Lakewood in particular, there's a whole demand that, um, Ms. Wilkie, Principal Wilkie is struggling to meet is this two-way dual language and more Spanish. Well, do we need to look at expanding that? And how do we do that at some of our other campuses? Because that might be something that would create some, uh, some desire for other schools in our feeder. Okay, option three, which is similar to option two, except in this instance, the two schools would then be designated one would be a pre-k-3 and the other one would be a 4-8. You see the numbers there so that we would be able to continue to look at well how many does that put at a particular campus 
and what's the capacity? Because I certainly don't want to put more kids than can fit there already from the beginning. That would then allow us in this particular model, some folks like the idea of, you know, the whole pre-K-8 uh, concept. The challenge is there, uh, as we've done in some other campuses, for instance, at Sanger, where we've gone to um, including 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, those students um, play for, if they want to do UIL band or athletics, they do that at the, at the neighboring um, closest middle school. So I think most of those students is at Gaston. And so that's still available, but it, it's not at the actual site. So something to consider. Another option, this is option four. And in this option, what you see here is we would have pre-K-2 students from Geneva Heights going to Mockingbird because Mockingbird would end up being a pre-K-2. Geneva Heights would be three through six. So what are the advantages here? Well, that removes sixth grade students from long. So if I've got an overcrowding issue, then, there's a, then we're kind of reducing some of the overcrowding. On the other hand, then when they get to seventh grade, they're going to have to meet at long. So you also have some drawbacks because other kids that have been at long during that period of time. So another way to do that is to see if we could create then pre-K-4s and then take Geneva Heights and create an intermediate for the entire feeder. Some of you may have gone to an intermediate school. It depends on, you know, different districts all do different types of arrangements. But so all the elementaries, if you will, would be a pre-K-4. And when I say all, I'm now talking about, as you can see listed on this particular slide, the campuses, you know, Mockingbird, Lakewood, Geneva Heights, um, except for Geneva Heights, Lipscomb and Mount Auburn. So then we would take Geneva Heights and that would become the intermediate fifth and sixth grade. Therefore, long would be a seventh, eighth grade. The advantage there is, and anyone can find research to support any one of these, okay? I've seen it work and I've seen it not work in every one of these configurations. There are some folks that will tell you sixth grade performance improves when they're not at a junior high. And then you can find research that shows sixth graders do fine in a middle school. So it really is about implementation uh, of the school program itself. It's not so much about the structure of the grade levels. However, the advantage here would be sixth grade is not a UIL competitive grade level. Seventh and eighth is. So again, if we're, depending on what our priorities are, we could easily then have all students at long being at long at the same time. We're not pulling a particular group away from the rest of the group, that then they would have to come back into a group where other folks have already become friends. And those of you that do or know anything about middle school or have a middle schooler, God bless you, um, know that that's a really tumultuous time. And so you can imagine that if you are not with that group and then you join long in seventh grade, but other folks have already been there, there's going to be a whole bunch of little sets of people, of kids who hang out, and then you're the outsider, and it takes a little bit of time. Now, obviously, if that were the case, we would set up counseling and so on in terms of how we would help kids be part of the process. Everything has a solution. Every single one of these has challenges, and every one of these has pros. So knowing that those are at least, at least, and I'm sure from those we could create hybrids and end up with many other versions. So what does our timeline look like? This is again predicated on the fact that we would be counting on a 2021 uh, bond election and then we would have an actual um, launch, there'd be designs, um, these are all your slides, Scott, so if I say anything wrong, you have to correct me or not. So, 
We have some questions already previously received. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Above 20. School begins operation in 2024. That I'm sorry. Yes, thank you for for interjecting. Absolutely. We this the best case scenario would be that all of this would take place so that we would open whatever format we open in um, August of 2024 for the school year 24-25. So as we noted earlier, there are, you all have some note cards so you can write some questions because I want to make sure we take as many as we can. So there were some previously uh, submitted questions and so I'm going to just kind of try to highlight some of those. Um, actually, what I'll do at this point, because we can post the responses to the ones we already have, the ones that you gave us that, I beg your pardon? Yeah. So I think at this point, um, we can just go ahead and, and kind of, we're not going to get to all of them, but we'll get started with questions comments, critiques. Uh, I've got tough skin, so no problem. It's all good. Um, remember, there are no decisions being made. I want to re-emphasize that. I cannot emphasize that enough. We just want to start taking information. Quick, as many of you submitted questions in advance through uh, uh, Tim Dawkins and, and Kathy Ruff um, at the respective PTA heads, I want to thank them for pulling all that together. All those questions have been included on a PDF, PDF file, which uh, Jolie Healy is passing around now. That file includes uh, the five options that Stephanie just talked through, as well as a list of those questions you guys asked and the um, our best attempt at answering some of them. So um, it, hopefully some of your questions will be addressed on that page, but if you have others, we're all ears. So uh, somebody's walking around with a mic. So oh, hi. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, would you mind reintroducing yourself again? Because I, I know Dustin, sorry. but I didn't catch your name and your title. I'm Stephanie Elizalde. I'm the chief of schools. Okay. Um, and sorry, just for my information, like where does chief of schools fit within the board? And um, She reports to the superintendent, and she runs all the schools. So she's the most senior person um, over all schools in the ISD. And Scott is the COO. So, so other than the superintendent. Yeah. Okay. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, my name is Lauren Laughlin, and I have two students at um, Mockingbird. And um, you started your presentation by talking about numbers and that this is a very data-driven decision. Um, you talked a bit about traffic patterns, um, attendance numbers. I heard um, the facility condition index, I think, was one thing you referenced. Uh, I did not hear any information about research or numbers in terms of what happens to the actual education of the students and the test scores when schools go through this type of transition. And I was wondering if you've done that research. I have not specifically done that research. I've just redesigned or reallocated schools for 28 years and because Patterns are always going to change. So if you're in a suburban school district, as an example, there have been times when I have been part of a school district in San Antonio where we had to create just a sixth grade center. Um, I think most of the data are going to support, in general, less transitions are always better. I would be remiss if I did not say that. However, there's also a lot to gain depending upon the focus of fewer grade levels. As an example, many, many times a pre-K-3 campus is able to kind of um, really stay to fidelity the authenticity of what we would consider developmental learning where the test of, you know, it's STAR today in 2024, I have no idea what it's going to be, Son of STAR or whatever we have. But um, in that process, we do see improvement in schools where there's less testing grades, and that allows teachers to have more of an ability to take kids through a scaffolded approach. But I've also seen that same design that isn't successful. 
Um, so, so much of it has to do with the leadership of the campus and the teachers on that campus. So I would say they're both pros and cons, but specifically going and gathering uh, research studies on that, I have not. I'm certainly uh, capable of getting our research and evaluation team to post some research items. Um, absolutely, we can post those for you. Hi, I have a daughter in second grade here at Geneva Heights, and prior to that, she was in private school. So the main reason we placed her here was because of the IB program. So what happens to the IB program if any of the other options happen where they're combining? Yeah, we would be absolutely committed. There would be, IB would then be expanded to any of the campuses if there were a, was an impact on other schools that are not IB. Currently, we've got Lipscomb, Geneva Heights, and that's it. So we could expand the IB program and would if that were going to be part of the design. The IB um, professional development in the elementary through the middle years program is very adaptable to any curriculum because IB isn't a curriculum in the early grades. It's a process. It's strategies. So it wouldn't conflict with anything that's already ongoing, but it is specific training. So that would be something we would want to absolutely address. Hi, my name is Miranda Rosenthal. I've got a uh, first grader at Mockingbird and a young daughter who will eventually attend some iteration of this. Um, in, in every option that you provided, there was a rebuilding of Geneva Heights. But what I kind of felt was a little glossed over is what happens to the students who attend Geneva Heights while the building is being rebuilt? You want to comment? Uh, well, we'd, we'd certainly have to look at that, you know, uh, possible, well, I mean, possibly, you know, portable buildings or is there enough room on the site to, to build a portion at a time and, and relocate kids? So again, as, yeah, different approaches at each school, but as Ms. Alizalde said, we're so early on in the process here, we haven't uh, truly analyzed that yet. My name is Jeff Kahn. I have a question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. What do you think is the effect of each of these different options on the sustainability of the Mockingbird Garden? So there should be zero negative effect. The Mockingbird Garden should be maintained. And in fact, uh, that was one of the questions that we'd already received. So I'm already, regardless now of which direction we go, I, I'm already looking at how do I add gardens at every one of the schools. So, because it's, if it's a plus for Mockingbird, then it should be a plus everywhere, regardless of the iterations. So if anything, it's just kind of brought it to my attention that it's something I need to do at each of the schools. So we're engaging with Real Gardens and some other areas, some other nonprofits to see how many of those I can bring in before in the spring and then till we get them all done. So, so I think it would be part of what I would ask to be put into our budget. So right now what I'm attempting to do is can I get some nonprofits to provide to some of the areas that I might not be able to have some private funding for right now. But this would be an excellent place should we get the Dallas Education Foundation going that might even be a place where we could go and see could the Dallas Education Foundation um, that the trustees are restarting, could they help fund something that had been previously funded by the community through private donations? So we'd be looking at all of those aspects. Okay. Um, hi, I have a question. Um, can you explain why Mockingbird Elementary was chosen as the school to transition into this? Um, all any of these propositions that you've suggested, I think it, rather than in, rather than any of the ele other elementary schools in the feeder pattern. Well, some of it had to do with um, location, and some of it had to do with which is the school that has a certain number of students. So that as we were looking to divide it up, if you will, if I use a school that's very under enrolled, then it kind of defeats the purpose of attempting to have more space 
for us to draw kids from the neighborhoods, to continue to draw kids from the neighborhoods. So that may be attending private school um, for the most part. Um, but there, there could be, there's nothing that I'm, we're married to do to on that either. I mean, it, it really, this came to us as uh, some constituents said, what about doing this with Mockingbird and Geneva Heights, which is how we kind of just started the conversation. But if there's some other schools that we think might, um, we're certainly open to engage in that conversation. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Dan Luber. Um, you know, Mockingbird is an A-rated school. I think it's, there's a lot of people there for a reason. Are you guys concerned about just messing with something that's doing really well right now instead of, you know, combining them? And I'm, I'm sure, you know, people might pull their kids from that school. Like, you have a good thing, maybe not mess with it. Is that, is that something you guys thought of? Like I said, there was no, option no. one <laughs> is we do nothing to any other schools and just rebuild Geneva Heights. And I certainly can appreciate um, folks saying, don't mess with us. We're doing just great. Um, certainly understand that. Um, we're always going to be looking at how do I get everybody to do great, right? So that's the only reason we were even kind of looking at it because we had an opportunity. I would just add, oh, sorry. I would just add to that, that when you think about things at the feeder pattern level, um, you know, we're, we're sort of a, a victim of our own success in the Woodrow feeder pattern. And, you, you know, you guys all live near here. You know that they're tearing down you know, uh, 1950s ranch style houses and building, you know, four or five bedroom places and families with young kids are moving in and, you know, the attendance um, and enrollment numbers um, clearly continue to climb across schools in the feeder pattern. And so, um, you know, one approach is that we just stick to the status quo and kind of bury our head in the sand and hope that, um, you know, that the enrollment trends either stop or reverse or go in a different direction, but um, I, for one, don't think that's responsible long-range planning. I, I think we need to be thoughtful about, um, at the whole feeder pattern level, what the demographics or, or you know, trends are, are showing us and, and be thoughtful about how we can make sure that all the kids up and down the feeder pattern are doing just as well as Mockingbird is. Um, and I, you know, some of these models have little to no impact on, on Mockingbird. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a um, sort of vision for the future that I think we all need to be thoughtful about um, rather than just hoping that if we keep doing the same that those trends will reverse. Okay, we have been a part of our community for like nine years. We've gone all the way through when it was Stonewall, K through um, five. We have one at Travis who's almost done and going to Townview, one at um, Long who's gone all the way through and is gonna go to Woodrow. And, for 10 years, all we've heard is like, go to jail long, go to jail long, and we've gone, and it is so wonderful, and it's, we are your community. I mean, we shop at the neighborhood grocery stores, we go to the neighborhood restaurants, we are all in, and so all of us, a big group of us, have been pushing for long, pushing for long, and it has become this amazing place of different cultures and different ethnicities and different people with different um, financial backgrounds and everybody, it's just becoming this wonderful thing. And then it would break my heart to see that change after all this work in the community to do that. People come out for the long run. They come out for the homecoming parade. People come out to Lakewood Shopping Center. I mean, everybody in this whole area, people are moving in to be a part of Lakewood. So I just feel like to take Mockingbird and just take it away from Long to me would probably I don't want to say ruin Long but it would change Long and the dynamics there and so I just feel like you have this community coming together that would make me very sad I definitely think the five six model seemed like something where all the fifth and sixth graders would that's come what I was going to ask so oh well, in that's, one place and then all go together to Long yeah that's I what I was going like to ask it sounds like you're really working. it sounds like you're reacting to option three and I hear you loud and clear so it, option five the one where there's a fifth and sixth grade here doesn't you know you wouldn't share the same concerns about that is that what folks generally feel yeah well that, that option actually has the benefit of bringing the community together earlier um, and they're For those of you that couldn't hear her, she was just saying that her perspective is that, uh, and what she's heard is that uh, most families want to bring their kids together across the elementary schools together sooner, uh, which would be that fifth option. So do, do folks have, uh, are, are there folks in the room that have concerns about the fifth option? Parking? That's always a big one, especially this building. 
Um, I'm sorry. Um, you somewhat address mine. I'm here from a different perspective. I work at Mockingbird, but I am a former deaf ed parent 20 years ago. That has a 60-year-old program of deaf ed, and I'm sorry, until this principal, it, this district overlooks that small minority, and I'm here for all those parents in deaf ed who have not a clue at what you're looking at. The resources in deaf ed are so spread thin that you start doing a five, six. I mean, you're just making it so much harder. You have no idea. Because I was raised, I, I'm of this community if you look at uh, my standing and my husband and our life. But so many of our deaf ed kids do not come from that, and they get so much exposure to so many wonderful things. And I know you're going to include them in it, but I really, really don't think you guys truly understand. You can't just take and say, okay, well, we'll just move some deaf ed teachers with some interpreters over here. It's not that simple. It took so long for those two programs to mesh. And that started with Juanita Anderson. And I just, you, you have no idea. When we're talking about how important it is to have differential learning and things like that, and yet when it comes to monumental decisions like this, I don't think you guys really do factor in deaf ed. And there's not a nice way to say it. I know the higher ups in deaf ed don't do it. It's because we've got a principal who gets it and is going to fight to protect deaf ed thank, than that, anything. Thank you for that. That, that is my real concern. Yeah, thank you for that feedback. I, uh, I, I agree that she's done an excellent job, and I, I spent some time with Ms. Manns this morning in some of the deaf ed classrooms, and she voiced the same concerns. So we're definitely hearing you loud and clear, and, and, and we'll be certain to take that into consideration. Can we make sure and get the mic over to this end of the... Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rebecca, and I've got two kiddos at Mockingbird. And we're talking tonight about a solution that may exist in five years. And my question is, what's a solution that can exist now or starting next school year? We are, um, as you can tell, six off from being at, at optimal capacity. We're talking about potentially um, one of the options, just rebuilding Geneva Heights. I know we got a wing recently that addressed some. It was a Band-Aid. Um, it did not address our common areas. Our lunches range anywhere from 10.30 to almost 2 o'clock. Um, we don't, all of our kids can't go to library in a week because it's not big enough. Our gym is not regulation size. I mean, everything you mentioned about the problems of the school. Um, are we going to be part of that moratorium to where we stop accepting transfers? Um, can we be considered 100% maximum? I think you had us down as 99% to where starting next year, like Long and Woodrow, we can say no more. And what are we going to do, even if one of these scenarios comes through, about whether it's our parking, our auditorium, our library, our gym, our cafeteria, fill in the blanks, um, how do we address that at not having to wait until 2024? And uh, people raising their arms and screaming, they just got a new wing when, again, it was a Band-Aid on what we truly needed. So uh, I'll let Stephanie speak to the transfer question. Um, I, I, I will just add that the, the same work and the same analysis that was done on this building as part of the long range facilities plan was done to every building in the district. And, you know, and Mockingbird is included in that analysis. There's a literally a 2,500 page document um, that I'd be happy to share with you on Dropbox because I can't email it um, that looks at every school um, and assesses the specific needs of each campus. Uh, the needs at, at Mockingbird are substantial, um, but frankly, the needs across the whole district are substantial, and the total amount of facility needs is, I think, nearing $6 billion, um, and, you know, we just don't have $6 billion, so, um, you know, the, the, the reality of that is that any money that we do have is spread 
thin between um, a lot of schools. And that my hope is that in 2021, or you know, hopefully even in my opinion, a little earlier, but I'm I'm just one trustee, that we would go back to the the voters and ask for a school bond program um, of probably a couple billion dollars, which is a lot of money. We would make sure that it's tax neutral for homeowners. But even if we were successful in getting $2 billion, we still have $6 billion in facility needs. So um, Mockingbird would be one of the one of the schools that, you know, I, I think would probably be addressed in the 2021 bond. But um, that's based on the, you know, stack ranking of the FCI scores, um, you know, because we, we, we focus the money first on the schools that need it most. And, um, you know, and Mockingbird's not at the top of that list. So actually, Trustee Marshall uh, shepherded um, changes to the policy with Rick. Dallas ISD has never, ever um, stated that a school is over capacity and not accepted new students. They, they've said no to transfers. They've never just said, we're not going to have any transfers until uh, the policy was rewritten um, and brought forth by your trustee. And in that, good, bad, or indifferent, it says chief of schools can determine <laughs> that there will be no transfers. So we're evaluating it. Long-winded answer is yes, we, I will absolutely look at it. I wanted to look at the ones that were over first, which is why um, Woodrow and Long uh, right now we we can't if I just roll up kids from one grade to another for next school year there's just no way we can accept any more transfers under pretty much any circumstances so that's going to create um, I'm even taking to the board some additional changes with regard to some exceptions to the attendance boundaries and I don't know how that's going to go because it's I mean I'm doing it based on the data and uh, I don't know if we're if I'm going to have support for the the request that I have with regard to O. M. Roberts um, and Long, and and that's not any reason other than the fact that I now have an open transfer policy in our district, so any student can apply for a transfer to any school that has room. So if Long doesn't have room, it doesn't have room. So, um, and Dade is now, which is their, their feeder pattern, is now a, a good school. We still have a lot of work to do, but at the time there were some, you know, very serious issues going on at Dade. So there's some things we're doing to also work towards that, but I haven't even started looking at Mockingbird, to be real honest with you, but I know that our team is taking notes, and so we'll debrief. And we'll absolutely look at the schools that are at, you know, the 99, 99, uh, 98 kind of percent capacity. My name's Lauren Saka. I have two uh, boys over at Mockingbird. And thank you all for putting this presentation together. It's helpful just to understand some of the options um, and have the dialogue. I did have a clarification question on this option number five. I think I'm reading it correctly where Mockingbird would be at a projected enrollment of 486. Is that right? So, but my understanding, if I'm reading this, it's pre-K through fourth of both Geneva Heights and Mockingbird. So given where Mockingbird is currently, we've got 675 kids. kids. I know you'd strip out around 100 for the fifth grade to go to Geneva Heights, but... Yeah, okay. I, may, I may have an error on this slide. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back. Absolutely. Thanks for bringing that. I think we, I think we just there, like I was just wondering if there's some rebuilding effort that might have to happen to accomplish that. There's also a question of of how the um, the Geneva Heights boundary would be drawn given that that circumstance. Um, we have nearby Lipscomb as well. That you know, especially after you eliminate fifth grade in this model and put it in Geneva Heights, enrollment in Lipscomb is going to further decline. So, you know, there may be some Geneva Heights families that opt to go to Lipscomb, and we might have a conversation about the attendance boundary um, for Geneva Heights being divided up between Mockingbird and Lipscomb. Um, that would be a natural next step, next question for this option. Hi. Um, I had a question, actually, on the back of this regarding number nine uh, about the demographics and population, and it just says, oh, our demo team will get back to you. Um, is there any talk of, like, redrawing district lines for any of this, like, or... Has any lines. of that been done? Yeah, I kind of like to stay employed. 
Um, and so uh, nothing is more contentious than redrawing of attendance boundaries. Um, and so I'm going to try and do everything I can to avoid that, if at all possible, when it comes to kids that um, families, because many of you moved into a particular neighborhood expecting to be going to a particular school. And so there's never a good time to do that because someone's always going to tell me that's why they moved into that area. Suburban districts do it all the time. That's all I can say. Uh, I would just add, there's been no conversation whatsoever about redrawing attendance boundaries, uh, but I do think it's important for people to understand the backdrop of this conversation, right? When we, when we think about the idea of maintaining the status quo and doing nothing, the demographic trends will eventually get us to the point where we will have to have a different conversation, right? So, and, and, and you know, each of your children may have graduated by then, um, but at some point, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now, there would have to be something that would change, right? We'd either have to build a new school, we'd have to talk about attendance boundaries, you know, finding a new school spot in East Dallas is, you know, would, would take an act of God. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to just understand that the reason we're having this conversation today that we're having is so that we can avoid that conversation that you're asking about. Um, I had a question just for the, um, for the teachers. Sorry, who's talking? Oh, Sorry. Hi, okay. I'm a teacher at Mockingbird. Um, so, and I know there's a lot of teachers here from all the schools and we mentioned data, which, you know, that's legit and we get that, but the data you guys mentioned about caring about the numbers and capacity, I think everyone knows that every year capacity numbers don't really matter because there's just a waiver that gets slapped on everything. And so it feels like this is another way to kind of play with numbers and consolidate all the kids so that you can kind of cut costs at the bottom line that might be like teachers, because then you get to kind of level out a couple teachers if you put them all together. So, so I, that worries us. Okay. Because at the end of the day, that's what the education the kids are getting is from the teachers and the class sizes. And this just feels like another way to bottom line it. So there's absolutely no doubt that all instruction takes place at the classroom level. And thank you for being a teacher in our district. Uh, I don't teach a single student, uh, and I have to remember that every single day. Um, that being said, I have not given waivers. I have shut the enrollment at several schools this year for the first time. So, um, and they're all, they're not just here. Um, Ann Richards uh, over in the Skyline area, I shut that enrollment down. Um, so, I have done it. It's difficult, but it has to be done. Folks that have transferred into schools, if people move into a neighborhood and that's their attendance zone, when they agree to a transfer, it says in the transfer that if we have students from the neighborhood attending that school, they will be required, if necessary, to return to another school other than that one because neighborhood children have to have a priority for their schools. That, that is the philosophy that we operate under. So those things generally don't happen overnight. You know, you don't get a whole new set of houses that get built without us knowing so that I don't allow. But I am, we both Trustee Marshall and I are putting forward that I will not be taking any transfers at Woodrow or Long uh, next year for sure. And it may be two years. And then after that, it'll have to be a year at a time because I have to see what's happening with the trends. So, and, and I'm, again, there's some folks that are upset because, well, my child transferred to Woodrow last year and I assumed that my younger daughter would also be able to go. I, that's not going to be possible. And so it, it's not going it, to, we have to do what's right given the circumstances. But again, all of this is about how do we plan for the future so that we are in a situation where we're maximizing all of our facilities and bringing all of our educational standards up so that our children in any one of our schools gets a premier education, which is what I think all of you want. And all of our teachers do that if we give them the right resources and the right place uh, to have that happen. Hi, my name is Melissa Kingston, and I live in the Geneva Heights attendance zone. And I wanted to, I have two questions really. 
Dustin, when you and I spoke on the phone, you said you were committed to saving the historic facade of this building and doing the renovations as necessary for the educational aspects. Are you still committed to doing that? Absolutely, and uh, I appreciate you bringing it up. I also have already talked with Scott Lane, who's here about that, and Scott, I'll let you comment, but Scott has agreed with me that whatever we do, whatever the administration comes to the board and whatever I support would maintain the historical and architectural significance of the exterior of the building. Thank you. Yeah, if, if you look at our presentation we did uh, last week at the board briefing, the comment for uh, Geneva Heights said either replace the school or do a total renovation of the facility. And the, the difference there, it, it, total renovation would be basically changing everything on the inside, getting classrooms the right size, and, and it would be much, much more than what we're talking about doing at other schools. And for that reason, uh, we would still, in a future bond, allocate enough funds that would either replace or do the total renovation of the building. But obviously, uh, we get to that point and, and the bond passes, we would meet with the community and see what's in the best interest of the community. Okay, thank you. My, my other is really more of a comment than a question. It sounds to me, from listening to this, that the Geneva Heights community is being asked to sacrifice the most and that there has been little thought given to the students from our school and what's going to happen to them because 30 minutes ago when we when someone asked well what happens to the kids when you demolish or renovate the school and there's not a plan so it sounds like you know geneva heights is being asked to give more than every, everyone else and i think that's unfair the the school has asked the community to step up and we have you know we we fund stuff every year at this school and so if you want to have that momentum and you want to have that community support from the lowest greenville businesses from the neighborhood associations from the people like me who live here who don't have children but nevertheless write a check to this school every month we have to get some consideration thank you hi my name is Carol, and I'm a parent of uh, ex-Mockingbird students. Um, I'm wondering, the conversations, uh, Dustin, you said that you had, who participated in those conversations? Were those conversations that were had with Mockingbird um, parents or Lakewood parents? Were they Geneva Height parents? There's a lot of stakeholders here, and we, we, we would like to know these these plans that you've created for us that we are going to live with our kids are going to what do we do i mean when do we get to be a part of the conversation because it feels kind of after the fact it's it's absolutely not after the fact and i this is the this is the opportunity for you to be involved i'm i'm very happy to have this like i mentioned be the first of many dialogues um you know any 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 parent um, that has ever reached out to me via email, phone, text message, or any, any, uh, in any medium would tell you that I am an, an, ex exceptionally responsive to um, get, get back with people and, you know, happy to meet one-on-one -on -one with anybody at any time. So that there, there has been no um, conversations that have baked up an, an, an idea. We've just, you know, taken some suggestions from folks, put them down on paper and, we came to you guys in this format to say, hey, which of these ideas make sense, which ones don't, and are there other ideas that you'd like to discuss? So, you know, if you have other, if, if five isn't the right number of options and there should be eight up there, then let's talk through them. I mean, I, mean, I'm, I, I don't have all the answers here. I agree because our kids, our kids don't go to private schools. Our kids go to these public schools. And we, the community, are the ones that are really growing the schools with the help of, I mean, the teachers, we're, we're a team, teachers, parents, the community, and without us, without our support, I mean, we're gonna have more typical Dallas schools, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to chat at any time if you have some other ideas, so definitely reach out.
Hi, I was just going to say, to kind of build on that, I guess one of our questions was, and I think this maybe was what you're trying to ask, is what, what kicked off this actual conversation? Is it overcrowding? What is it? What's the, the problem? The, the initial... What are we... Fun, what are we actually trying the initial to stimulus for the conversation was the long range plan discussion so when the we we alluded to earlier the 2500 page document of a review of every school in the district uh, scott lane here um, commissioned that study um, at the at the request of the board and about two months ago there was a saturday board workshop where he showed the initial proposal and the data that came from that conversation and the, um, the data in that study suggested that Geneva Heights needed to be, well, at the time, the suggestion was torn down and rebuilt. We have now amended that um, to make sure that we um, take into consideration the architectural significance of the building. However, given that we're going to be investing this money in the future of a massive remodel of Geneva Heights, then there was the question, okay, well, if we're going to spend all that money, let's make sure that we're spending it in a thoughtful manner and that we're building the building that we need in the future at Geneva Heights. Uh, you know, and I would say to, to answer that question and make sure that you're spending the money right way, the right way, you have to look at the broader demographic trends of the whole feeder pattern and enrollment trends. And, and so, you know, as we continue to have that dialogue, you know, you, you, you very quickly get to the point of talking about overcrowding at Mockingbird, Lakewood, Long, and Woodrow. I don't know who has the mic. Oh, thanks. I'm glad I'm next because there's a follow-up to that. Uh, do I hear correctly that there isn't a no-build option? Geneva Heights has to change in one way or another. Uh, well, the, the FCI score of Geneva Heights is the fourth worst in all of DISD. So I, I guess I was taking it for granted that people would want the building condition to improve. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it has to, but I, I would be shocked if the perspective of the community is that they do not want bond money to be invested in their school. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure Principal Hart would be um, would be happy to r r rattle off a, a hundred things he wants fixed in this building. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it, I guess it theoretically is an option to do nothing. I, I wouldn't suggest it. Uh, and let me give you a. a brief explanation of how the FCI works, the facility condition index, what, what they do is they, they look at everything in the building that needs to be repaired and they get a dollar number for that. Then they divide it by what the cost would be to build a brand new building. So basically when you do that for Geneva Heights, you're at 91%. So it's basically saying for 9% more, you can get a brand new building rather than fix everything that needs to be fixed in here. For which building? 45. Age isn't the factor. Uh, what you'll find a lot is uh, the roofs are in bad condition. Uh, mechanical systems, things that you really don't see when you go into a building that are really expensive to replace. And that's, that's what the long range plan provides for us on all the buildings throughout the district. Uh, we've definitely included in the plan uh, environmental assessment, so uh, any issues with leakage, uh, roof problems, window problems, things like that were included. Asbestos, I would say yes. There's probably asbestos in every, almost every single building in the district. Is it a, a danger? No, it is not. It is in a non-friable condition. So uh, our buildings are perfectly safe. However, if we come in and do a massive renovation, uh, most likely it'll be disturbed and it'll have to be abated 
as a part of the renovation. No, ma'am, there is not. I, um, I'm Renee Strickland, and I um, want, I, I'm a little concerned with the, the language you used about you would get a brand new building when we've been talking about an 87 year old building that has been described as having a lot of historic character and has been part of this neighborhood for you know, almost nine decades. Um, I have a child who attends Lakewood Elementary and that building added on, uh, solar prep for girls added on and it can still maintain the integrity uh, of those structures within the neighborhoods. And I understand there's a lot that needs to be done to an elementary school to expand it and, and let it continue meeting the needs of the neighborhood. But do we, are, which way are you guys leaning in terms of re demolishing, replacing, you're saying, let's just get a brand new shiny building versus maintaining and keeping that integrity and historic nature of our of the school? So I, I apologize if uh, there's been sort of lack of clarity in the terms that we're using. So let me let me state it unequivocally. Um, it is our intention that any work that is done on this building would maintain the historical and architectural exterior of the building. Now, the, 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 the language, the distinction in the language that Scott's using is because when he thinks about allocating the money, the decision is, should, should I allocate enough money for, for rebuilding a school? And it is his intention to allocate the money as if we were rebuilding the school and then to demo the interior of the building and you know essentially start from scratch with the shell of the original architecture intact. I, I share the uh, concerns about the architectural integrity, but I think more importantly, it, it's less disruptive for the children if you, you know, sort of strategically add on. And it seems to me uh, they would do better. They would perform better. It would improve the overall performance of the school if you didn't move them, shuffle them around in temporary facilities. And I think the best way to relieve the pressure on Mockingbird is to improve Geneva Heights. And so I, I really would like to encourage us to, seriously consider, you know, strategic additions, not wholesale, you know, leveling of the facility. We agree. So if I'm not mistaken, Lakewood also feeds into JL Long, correct? So yes. why are they not part of this overhaul conversation? I don't understand that. Well, Lake, Lakewood is impacted in both options four and five that were presented earlier. So well, it, no it would be. There's no mention of them, hence it, the confusion. Well, if we can go back to the option five slide. Um, the option five is to take all fifth grade uh, in all elementary schools, including Lakewood, and put it here with all sixth grade classes from Long. So. But and, they and, wouldn't have to, they wouldn't be redesignated like Mockingbird would become K through four. They would maintain no, they would. their, Lakewood they would. would maintain their K through no. six. No. Lake would be, would be treated just like everybody else, which by the way, would also have the added benefit of alleviating overcrowding at Lakewood. Can we, can we, there's a couple questions down here if you, if you don't mind bringing the mic. Thanks. We've got about uh, 12 minutes or so left. I know you've both talked recently about the OM Roberts um, attendance issue and those kids coming to Long, and I know that we usually get about 100 students per year from there. I just wonder if that situation is hopefully quickly resolved, does that Necess I mean, does that, <laughs> would that make a change in these plans or would it not be enough of a, a dent in the enrollment? Actually, it, we average 54 students from Long uh, over the last uh, three years each year. So, um, but it would have no impact uh, in terms of other than really affecting the fact that Long um, needs to not have other students because I'm going to just not have transfers at long, like I said, for at least a year. But there was a specific um, board exception to the attendance policy that allowed them to not be a transfer. And so, uh, and I think at the time it was probably necessary, 
but I don't see the data the same. And so we're in a situation where I'm going to be making that recommendation um, for that not to be part of the exception. Thank you. The question was about OM Roberts, and for those of you that are not um, familiar with OM Roberts, they, they have um, what's called an option of attendance. They are literally the only school in all of Dallas ISD that has an option to um, proceed after elementary school at OM Roberts to either Dade Middle School and on to Madison, or they can go to Long and Woodrow, um, which that was something that the, the board passed in 2012. Um, and it's called the OM Roberts option. Uh, again, it's literally the only school in the school district uh, that has such an option. And Stephanie is suggesting that the administration is going to bring to the board um, a recommendation to terminate that option, uh, which would send the OM Roberts kids back to their original feeder pattern. And uh, I think that the plan is to vote on that in January. Yeah. I have a question regarding the FCI scores. When were they determined? Uh, they were probably done four to six months ago, I would say. Uh, the whole process, the whole long range plan took about uh, 15 months. I don't so, know who's talking. I'm right here. Uh, oh. <laughs> so a few years ago when we went through the interim bridge plan process, both Lakewood and, and Mockingbird were at a very high percentage rate. They've since been reduced significantly. Is that because of the additions at those two schools? Definitely. Uh, the more work you do, uh, the less cost you need. Your numerator decreases, which in turn in, uh, decreases the percentage. And then, so how does the optimal capacity and FCI score correlate together? The optimal capacity, part of the, the long-range plan was to, deter, to determine how, how many kids could fit in a school, the capacity, and you compare that to the enrollment, and, and you actually obtain a maximum capacity. Let's say you put 25 kids in every single room, and you have a maximum capacity. The optimal capacity actually takes about 90% of that number, so it reduces because in all reality, um, you're not going to do that. You're not going to put that many kids in a room, whether it's the master schedules, the programs at that particular school, and then you also take into account like uh, special education rooms are, are calculated at 12 kids a room or 15 kids a room rather than 22 kids a room for K through 2. Okay, and because Lipscomb is also underutilized, would that potentially be an option or, or cons consider Lipscomb as a tie to Geneva Heights versus? We can certainly consider options at Lipscomb. I, I will tell you from a construction standpoint, it's a lot harder at Lipscomb because it's designated as a landmark. So um, it's very difficult for us to make the changes that we would need to accommodate older students. I think there's a question Hi, in the uh, back. Chris Peters. Oh, hey, Chris. I had three go through uh, Mockingbird and one is at Long right now. Um, so I'm, I'm particularly intrigued by this, uh, this idea here, um, but a couple questions to clarify. Optal capacity, does that include portables? No, it doesn't. No, okay. And I think we established Morin's question that probably the 849 projected enrollment of Geneva Heights under this model is overstated because Mockingbird is understated. Um, I, I think we're going to have to go back yeah, and double check those numbers and, and fix them. But I, it, it looks to me like the Geneva Heights number may be right, but that the Mockingbird number doesn't include the extra K through four from, uh, from Geneva Heights. We can confirm that later. And the A49 wouldn't include Oren Roberts kids? No, they, they wouldn't, they, they're wouldn't, not part of the elementary. Meaning they wouldn't no. be able to come. No. You're projecting that you'll be successful. Well, that's, okay. that, that shouldn't even be a question because the existing board policy option for Oren Roberts speaks nothing of elementary schools. So yeah. they, would not, they would not be considered. And this would be a 5-6 elementary school. Well, yeah, and it, it, you could call it whatever you want, but it's not stipulated in the board policy that, going. yeah. David, we had a question. Hang on one second. Question. Do I have the numbers reversed there for? Okay. 
and but the mockingbird number of 486 for pre-k4 you'll go back and double check that one okay thanks could you could you potentially go back to the timeline slide for a moment my, my question is how long between today and when students would be disrupted here at geneva heights and then how long from that day until students find a new routine or whatever the 2024 data is i just can't see it from back here so Yeah, it looks like uh, construction had probably start in January of 23, January, February of 23. So that would be ongoing uh, through the summer of 2024. So half a school year and part uh, of the yes. next, correct? start closer to the summer of 2023 and continue through that next school year. Okay, uh, I'm a parent of a student here uh, at this school. Uh, I wanted to make a correction though. On Owen Roberts, the original feeder pattern for Owen Roberts was long in Woodrow. It was never, what is it, Dave, Wade? Yeah, the original feeder pattern was long in Woodrow and I know that because I live around that area. And so my, the, my, my school, my middle school was Long and Woodrow. That's where I went, that's where I grew up. Um, so in, in 2012, the board passed a policy to um, to s make the entire O.M. Roberts feeder pattern part of Dade, but, but passed this option where they could go to Long or Woodrow. Prior to 2012, the O.M. Roberts attendance boundary was actually divided in half with a very crazy little gerrymandered line. And half of the feeder pattern was zoned for Long and the other half was zoned for Dade. Um, it was that, and at that time, I believe it was the only school in the district to have its own feeder pattern split in half between two middle schools. Yeah, Ken. Oh, do you need a mic? Schools aren't in my district, so I'm not as familiar. So, yeah. the, the question was, why not send the boys from the boys' solar that we currently have? Is that, am I getting that correct? That's at, that's at Kennedy to the former J.W. Ray site, which is now an Ignite school. Well, so I do have like 700 kids at Chavez, so I don't have room there. <laughs> um, well, so the whole idea is anytime I've got, we've got an underutilized building, when we start talking about trying to move students, it creates the same kind of anxiety that everybody in here is feeling. But Ignite in particular has just one particular learning, I mean, it's a you know, it's a project-based learning school based in STEM, and it's middle school. And the boys' solar will grow out to be like the girls' solar, ultimately a pre-K-8. And so I, we're growing that one. We've got a wait list there. So the capacity at Kennedy is going to be able to meet that needs. We have fields there. So that really made the most sense for that school. I think we got time for one last question. So right there. So uh, yeah, quick question. So I'm really leaning into uh, option five. I feel like it offers up a lot of great because it provides relief for everybody. Because I think you're right. More and more people are moving in. The schools are getting more and more, you know, increased with population. So the question. So as far as the fifth and sixth grade, so they would all. So all elementary schools would feed in to this school. How many? I, I'm sorry. How many elementary schools would feed into this fifth and sixth grade potentially in option five? Yeah. How many Lips, do we have? Lipscomb, Lakewood, um, Mount Auburn, and Mockingbird. Gotcha. So four total? Four. And including the existing kids here, right? Gotcha. Yes. So then how many – so this space can handle all those additional students coming in from all those existing schools? Well, part of the reason why we're having this conversation early is because we can build the new building to accommodate whatever we need it to, um, you know, as an addition to this structure. So, Yeah. It, it, it would be built to be sure that it would accommodate all those kids if we chose to pursue that model. Okay, great. Thanks.
Great. Well, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. It's 7.30. I know you guys got things to go on to. As I mentioned, this will be the first um, of many conversations about this. So thank you guys for taking the time to chat.